on. It's based on Christian Roots and Growing Branches. It's on Tuesdays at 7.30 p.m. via Zoom. You can find the Zoom link to that in the newsletter right under where you found the link to, this, to the, the YouTube service. Most important, one week from today, December 19th, we will be hosting Family Promise. We will not be hosting it in the church this time uh, because of COVID. So families will be staying in an extended stay hotel. So, but we will be responsible for providing evening meals for them. It can be done in a variety of ways. They can go have uh, prepared meals uh, which have to be delivered to the hotel. Uh, or you can supply grocery cards, gift cards to restaurants, Grubhub, DoorDash cards. Um, you can deliver these cards any day of the week down to the Middlebrook Pike Day, day Center. And if you don't have a way to do that, if you contact um, Family Promise on the website, their um, email at Family Promise at Westside. West Side. Yes? Right. Uh, and that goes for meals or cards. Right. Then either Elizabeth or I will take them down there. She's kind of conveying that. And if people want to bring cards here, that either I or Elizabeth is here. Okay. All right. So, um, thanks. Thanks, Ellen. So, yes, if you, uh, you can contact Elizabeth Corbett. Uh, Brad, we're not, are we on YouTube net yet? Okay, so I'm not going to give Elizabeth's phone number over YouTube, but you can email um, familypromise at westsideuuc.org um, if you need more information or, or need someone to deliver things for you. Christmas Eve. We all love the Christmas Eve service, and this year we're going to be doing it a little bit differently. We're going to have outdoors caroling on Christmas Eve between 4 and 5 p.m., so everybody will be able to join in the singing at the Christmas car for the Christmas carols because we will be outdoors. We will also have cocoa and encourage people to bring cookies if they like to share. And then at 5 p.m. we'll parade indoors for, uh, for a service, a Christmas Eve service. I think lastly, we do, uh, now that we are back having in-person services, we do need to have greeters at the door um, we've always had uh, helpful volunteers, so if you're interested in, um, in doing that, please contact Alice Thornton or Jerry Thornton to do that. I think that's it. So today's service will get started now, and I just want to welcome everybody, both those of you who are here with us in the in-person service, um, or if you're joining us on YouTube. We're glad you're with us today, and uh, we're glad to have you, even if you come and listen to the YouTube, watch the YouTube at some later date. Westside is a place of welcome for all people of goodwill, regardless of their specific beliefs, their lifestyle, or their orientation. A few minutes after today's service, which should run maybe 40, 45 minutes, we will be having a Zoom coffee hour. In order to attend the coffee hour, you need to get out of YouTube, if you're on YouTube, and log in on Zoom. And we will have an area in the back where if you want to participate uh, through coffee hour on Zoom here at the church, we can do that too. The Zoom link is in, for the coffee hour is in the Westside newsletter, again, right where you found the YouTube link. I didn't introduce myself. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Linda Fippen. My pronouns are she, her, hers. As a member of the worship committee, I will be assisting with today's uh, service. So now, as we prepare to actually start the part of the, ser the service, Take a breath, be present in the moment as Reverend Carol sounds the Tibetan singing bowl. Good morning, everyone. If I haven't met you yet, I'm Reverend Carol Badeau. I'm privileged to serve here as minister. My pronouns are she, her, and hers, and I'm happy to see you all. 
today. Today we're going to be talking about light. So as I invite the bowl to sound, I want to in invite you to imagine that in the center of your chest there is a flame. Close your eyes if you feel like it. And let your eyes rest on something that makes you feel peaceful. And imagine that there's a flame in the middle of you. It's the flame that is a comfort when you're afraid. It's the flame that gives you warmth in times of chill, guides you in times of uncertainty or darkness. It may be, depending on your belief system, a flame that connects you to something higher, to the divine, to the life force, to the breath that connects us all. But as we breathe in and out, as the bowl sings to us, just allow that flame that is in the center of you to grow stronger and brighter. Reverend Carol will light the chalice this morning while I share these words from Charles A. Howe entitled New Light. We light this chalice to affirm that new light is ever waiting to break through to enlighten our ways. That new truth is ever waiting to break through to illumine our minds. And that new love is ever waiting to break through to warm our hearts. May we be open to this light and to the rich possibilities that it brings us. This morning we're adding a little bit to our service, just a, another candle that we hadn't planned on. I'm going to ask Linda to light our candle for the community as we take a moment to honor the lives that were lost in the tornadoes this weekend and remember all those who are struggling where their homes, their communities, and their businesses have been destroyed. Let us take a moment to send just a little bit of that light from the center of ourselves to all of those who are struggling and suffering and offer up a prayer of hope that they may be supported in this time of challenge. So this season is a season when we do a lot of lighting things. We light our chalice all year round as Unitarian Universalists, but this particular season of the year, we seem to really, as a society, as a culture, and as a world, really like to light a lot of things. And what is it about the concept of light that is so magical for us? You know, light is really at the center of our human stories. From the beginning of all recorded history up to the present day, light is an essential part of the stories that humans tell. And it symbolizes many things, hope and joy and comfort. Technically, technically, light is electromagnetic radiation that shows properties of both wave and particle. Which actually, if you think about that, is kind of cool, right? That's kind of cool that it shows properties of both form and motion. And it's transformative, too. Probably most importantly, light in the form of sunlight, which we actually have today. How many of us are grateful when we have sunlight instead of rain? That very fact tells us a little bit of something about why we are so connected to the concept of light. Without sunlight, there would not be life on our planet. It is what keeps us warm when we are cold. Fire keeps us warm when we are cold. And it heats our food, often making it safer for us to eat. 
So without light and fire, we wouldn't be able to be here. And when we don't have light or when we don't have heat, we get a little depressed or anxious, right? So think about this. If you were living 2,000 years ago, 300 years ago, without the wonder of electric lights, think about what it would be like this time of year in the northern hemisphere as the days get darker. You wouldn't have very much light. It would be colder. You wouldn't have quite the same control over it. This fact has given rise throughout human history to all sorts of rituals and celebrations that honor the light. Okay, so we try to coax the sun back and get it to stick around or we light fires to remind ourselves that even when it's dark, we can bring the light. And today what we're going to do is review some of the most widely celebrated um, holidays and rituals from around the world that celebrate light in all its symbolic meanings. So as we approach the darkest day of the year, which is coming up in just over a week, we're going to be thinking about what does light actually mean to us? The first of the holidays that we're going to talk about is Diwali, which is also known as Diwali or Deepavali, as well as several other names. It's celebrated not only by Hindus, but also by Jains, Sikhs, and even some Buddhists. The name comes from the Sanskrit word Deepavali, which means a row or a series of lights. It's a five-day festival that take pl takes place in the Hindu month of Kartika, which corresponds to mid-October through mid-November in the Western calendar. It's associated with Lakshmi, the Hindu goddess of prosperity, but also many other deities depending upon regional traditions. People prepare for this holiday by cleaning their houses and workplaces and decorating them with oil lamps and traditional artworks called rangoli. These activities symbolize the victory of light over darkness, good over evil, and knowledge over ignorance. Diwali was noted in Sanskrit texts as early as the middle of the first millennium of the Common Era though it likely predated these texts and originated in more ancient harvest festivals. It is now celebrated as a public holiday in many countries outside of India, wherever there are significant po uh, populations of people from the Indian subcontinent, such as Fiji, Singapore, Guyana, Myanmar, Trinidad and Tobago, and many others. So one of the properties of light that I really uh, think is important in the celebration of Diwali, well, there are two. One is beauty. Um, I don't know if any of you have ever seen a Diwali celebration. The, there's a Hindu group that meets here, and they held their Diwali celebration at the end of October. And often these celebrations involve enormous collections of candles in, in beautiful color patterns. We had, in our building, we had flowers of candles. They were, they were crafted into the shapes of flowers, t dozens and dozens of candles going down the hallways. Another really important concept, if you, uh, if you read some Hindu teachers on the subject of Diwali, one of the things they talk about is illuminating the darkness. So one of the properties of light that we can imagine also inside ourselves, right, is this ability to have clarity in the darkness. Many Hindu teachings talk about how essential this is to human survival, the ability to find light and clarity, to find understanding. And this version of light helps us find the path, find, see the bigger picture, see our way out of trouble. So for a minute, just connect with that part of yourself. What is that part of yourself or your connection to something larger that gives you guidance when you're not quite sure where to go? I think most of us have some familiarity with Hanukkah and the traditional Hanukkah story. <clears throat> 
But in looking into its history, I found some twists and turns that I didn't know about. Hanukkah, which means dedication in Hebrew, is celebrated starting on the 25th day of the Hebrew month Kislev, which may be anywhere from late November to late December in the Western calendar. This year, it took place from November 28th through December 6th. Lighting a candle on one branch of the menorah each day is an important symbolic part of the Hanukkah observances, and traditional foods are eaten, especially fried foods, like potato pancakes the lot called latkes and jelly donuts called sufganyot. The history of Hanukkah begins in the second century BCE in Judea, which was part of ancient Palestine and included the city of Jerusalem. At this time, Judea was under the rule of the Seleucid king of Syria, Antiochus III. The Seleucid Empire was part of the remains of the empire of Alexander the Great, it ranged from the eastern lands of the Mediterranean all the way to the border of India and was controlled by the Greeks. Antiochus III was said to be tolerant of the Jews in Judea and allowed them to practice their religion. His son, Antiochus IV, Epiphanes, however, was quite a different story. He forced the Jews in Judea to worship the Greek gods and in 168 BCE, his soldiers attacked Jerusalem, killing many people and desecrating the second temple, in which they then built an altar to Zeus and slaughtered pigs. The Jews resisted Antiochus and his tyranny, and resistors led by Judah Maccabee waged a guerrilla war against the Syrians and drove them out of Jerusalem. The temple was then cleansed, the altar rebuilt, and the menorah was relit but there was only enough oil for one day. Miraculously, the menorah remained lit for eight days, allowing time to obtain more oil. This miracle is symbolized by the eight branches of the modern menorah. There are actually other versions of the story that describe the cleansing and dedication of the temple, but do not include the miracle of oil. And there are some scholars that claim Hanukkah was actually a celebration of the seven-day holiday of Sukkot, which had been delayed because of the rebellion in Jerusalem. Nevertheless, the traditional story recounted earlier is the one that is recognized by all the major branches of Judaism. So in, in the version of the Hanukkah story that's most often told, you have a people who are oppressed and who are struggling to regain their independence and their autonomy and to be able to live their lives as they wish and to practice their religion as they wish. In this story, the way that the temple candle, the temple menorah burns for seven days is a miracle. And that is a form of hope. It provides hope. So that's another concept that light is associated with for us. Hope in times of despair. This represents the feeling or the sense that things are gonna be okay, that the worst is over, that we are supported by something bigger than ourselves. And the lighting of the menorah in particular goes beyond simple hope to the promise of the miraculous. This is the sort of hope that believes anything is possible, that it is possible for the impossible to occur, that the very worst circumstances can be turned around. And so there are moments in all our lives when we feel like it's just impossible. We're just not going to be able to get past this thing, whatever it is. We all have those moments. Sometimes they're brief. Sometimes they're quite long. There is a light that lives within us and in our world that offers us hope that even the most impossible, terrible circumstances can be overcome. And that's what this light represents. The choir is going to come up and we're going to sing for you a song that tells a little bit of the story of the Maccabees defeating that impossible oppression. It's called Light One Candle.
Now we move on to the festival of Yule and the winter solstice. Yule was originally a festival of ancient Germanic peoples of northern Europe, including the Norse and the Anglo-Saxons. The name appears to have derived from Jolnir, one of the many names of the Norse god Odin. It is related to the winter solstice, but it is also associated with something called the wild hunt. It's a folklore motif in which Odin leads or is pursued across the sky by a procession of supernatural beings, hunters, dead souls, ghost dogs, fairies, elves, and valkyries. It's also a time when undead beings wandered the earth. The Yule season or Yuletide extended for anywhere from 12 days up to as much as two months, equivalent to modern December and January but the main celebrations were centered around the winter solstice. Feasting and drinking were prominent, but animal sacrifices were also part of this observance. In addition to the, uh, the religious element of the sacrifice to the gods to ensure the return of the sun, this may have been because the winter, the deepest part of winter in these northern climes lay ahead, and there would have been no food to feed the domestic animals that they had. Yule was eventually supplanted by Christianity in Northern Europe by about the 10th or 11th century. However, some Yule traditions have been carried through all the way to modern times, including the burning of a Yule log and decorating with evergreens. Other celebrations of the winter solstice abound throughout the world and extend deep into human history. Knowledge of the patterns of the seasons was essential in agricultural societies to determine when to plant. But it was also important to hunter-gatherers and pastoralists to know the movement of the animals they hunted and the emergence of the, emergence of the plants that they foraged and the mating and the birthing of their herd animals. Because the winter solstice marks the beginning of the sun's journey from the longest, darkest night towards spring and renewal, it was an obvious time to celebrate the return of the sun's light and warmth and to perform rituals to ensure that the sun did in fact return. Neolithic people made stupendous efforts to build structures such as Stonehenge in England and Newgrange in Ireland that would mark the position of the sun at the winter solstice. 
Today, the winter solstice continues to be celebrated in cultures as otherwise as diverse as Japan and Iran, Peru and China, and among indigenous peoples of North America and elsewhere, as well as among neo-pagan believers. So one of the central qualities of light that the, the Yule celebrations and the winter solstice celebrations in the past and even today evoke is an understanding of light as the magical life force that lives in our bodies and in nature. In the Yule log, the way the Yule log works is this. Each year there's a, at, at the winter solstice, great fires are lit to bring warmth. And the, often they're in the home or in their community. And then at the end of that fire, which is supposed to keep the light going all through the night of the darkest night, you keep the last little bit of the log to start next year's fire. Okay? So what this represents is that life continues that out of death and darkness and cold ashes, new birth and new life come. So as the Yule fires are lit from the remains of the previous year's flames, the flames are ignited to represent continuing life even after death. Much of the pagan celebrations of Yule or the winter, winter solstice is about how we go through cycles of life and death and rebirth. So for many people's religion, this is a cyclical pattern that is in nature that is also in humans. Just as the sun seems to die in the fall and winter only to be reborn again in spring, and the Yule log is relit from the burnt end of last year's now dead and cold fire, we understand that our inner spark or inner flame seems to die only to come back again. And whether or not we actually believe that theology, the symbolism of it's quite important. That we can think it's all over, it's all done, we have to give, there's nothing left. And suddenly new growth springs up when we least expect it. Life comes back in ways we weren't expecting or predicting. And that is really the center of the Yule celebration, this idea of the possibility of being reborn. We're now going to take an offering to support the church's works and our position in the community as a provider of, of solace and support. Christmas, celebrating the birth of Jesus, is certainly high in the pantheon of holidays in the United States and is widely observed elsewhere, even in countries not associated with Christianity, such as Japan. So how did December 25th come to be accepted as Jesus' birthday? There is no mention of the time of the date of Jesus' birth in the Gospels. 
ideas about how December 25th was chosen are common and, and uh, sometimes conflicting. One that is often heard is that it supplanted the Roman holiday of Saturnalia, which took place on the winter solstice, which was December 25th in the Julian calendar. December 25th was also nine months after the vernal equinox, also March 25th on the Julian calendar. And this is the date of the Feast of the Annunciation that celebrates the conception or incarnation of Jesus. Scholars continue to debate these explanations. Regardless of how the date was arrived at, Christmas celebration took on many existing pagan practices like feasting and drinking and has a bit of a checkered past. It was first documented in Rome during the fourth century after which it declined. Christmas was not much observed in the early Middle Ages, which tended to focus more on the Epiphany, the, the time when the, the, the Magi visited the Christ child. Christmas Day itself began to take on more prominence with the coronation of Charlemagne as the Holy Roman Emperor on Christmas Day in the year 800. Celebrations did grow more common throughout the ages and more ruly with raucous feasting and drinking and were looked on with such disapproval by the Puritans in England that they banned Christmas celebrations for a time. However, celebrations were restored after pro-Christmas rioting took, out, took place. <laughs> the war on Christmas lives is part of our history here. Uh, the Puritans in colonial America were equally hard on the holiday, but other religious groups outside of Puritan-controlled colonies continued their Christmas celebrations. After the American Revolution, Christmas was again disparaged by some because it was an English holiday. There were many more ups and downs in the popularity and practice of Christmas celebrations until about the 19th century when they began to consolidate into the kind of celebrations that we know today. One of, the, one of the other holidays that we in this tradition don't have much education about around Christmas time is the preparation for Christmas. And when I grew up in the Catholic Church, an Advent was as important as Christmas itself. An Advent is, is something that is about preparing ourselves for the time of Christ's coming. So this is, this is a holiday with both secular and sacred meanings. Um, the Christmas trees have pagan roots. The Advent candles are lit to help us prepare for the, for the coming of Christ. And those, each of those candles in the Advent uh, wreath represent a different property of light and also a property of faith and a property of Jesus' life. They represent hope, faith, joy, and peace. And the center candle, the white one in the center, is um, often considered, it's lit on Christmas Eve as a representation of Christ's light itself arriving in the world. Now the qualities of light that I find most interesting about this particular set of holidays is is something about what we choose to do. We've been talking about light and the way it comes to us, the way we receive it, right? We've been talking about things like, you know, clarity, having light give us clarity, having hope when we don't feel hopeful, having a sense of our life force. These are things that we receive for the most part. But one of the things that we do most at this time of year is, boy, we willfully create light. If you have watched the Christmas light shows on television, you know how true this is. How many of you have seen a neighborhood that's just crazy lit up, right? We become almost defiant at this time of year in the secular traditions about purposefully choosing light. So light illuminates things just by default, right? It makes things brighter, all right? It, it's, it's inherently transformative. But the Advent candles and the Christmas tree and the 
reindeer on our rooftops and the Christmas lights on our houses. These are saying something different. These are saying something about our intention and our choice of light, our intentional creation of light, right? We intentionally light candles and color our houses. We sing deck the halls. We don our gay apparel. We light our candles when we invite people to come to our homes. We are making a statement about our own intentions. We are making statements about how we choose to use our light in the world. We are making a statement about our passion and our commitment. Often when we light our chalice, we talk about how it represents our passion and our commitment. And that's a part of this, right? So as we have the Advent candles and the Christmas tree lit, we remember that light isn't always something we just receive or are passively available to. It is something that we intentionally choose. And let's add another sacred layer to this. For, for those of us who are Christian or who honor the Christian traditions, this is also about faith. It's about faith that there is something bigger than us that we choose to rely on. It's about faith that there is something that we can choose to connect to, that we can choose to put our attention on, that will hold us through, that will carry us, and that will bring us all those other qualities of light that we so need. Now, the choir is going to sing this. I know you all are not supposed to sing. We are all going to sing one of the songs that's about purposefully deciding to make the holidays bright. Um, I know you're not supposed to sing, hum quietly inside your masks. We're going to sing Deck the Halls. Unlike the other holidays we've talked about, Kwanzaa has quite a short and well-documented history. It was invented in 1966 after the Watts riots by Molana Karenga, a professor of African American studies and a black power activist. It was intended as a celebration of African American culture and was based on harvest festival traditions of several African nations. The name Kwanzaa comes from the Swahili phrase, Matunda ya Kwanzaa, meaning first fruits. Kwanzaa has aspects that will sound rather familiar to Unitarian Universalists. It has seven principles, for example, though these principles are specifically focused on creating and supporting solidarity in the African American community. Kwanzaa is celebrated for seven days, beginning on December 26th and ending on January 1st. On each of these seven days, a candle representing one of the seven principles is lit. Kwanzaa was originally anti-Christian because, in the view of Dr. Karenga, 
Christianity was a white religion and Jesus was psychotic. Later, however, the stance was changed to add Kwanzaa to other religions rather than to replace them, partially in order not to alienate the many African American Christians. So like many other traditions of light, Kwanzaa invokes many of the qualities we've already discussed. But one that is particularly pronounced in the tradition of Kwanzaa, especially knowing how new it is, is this idea of remembering the past, honoring the ancestors, and being grateful for what we have. And you can ask the question, how does light evoke these principles? One of the properties of light that we haven't yet considered is its unifying quality. Every single person through all time, every human that has ever walked on this planet, in fact, many of the other species, one could say all of the other species that have lived on this planet have needed and relied upon light. A campfire today is very much the same as it was 200 or 2,000 years ago. And the human experience of sitting in front of a fire is probably very similar today to what it has been through all of time. We all feel the same kind of relief when heat comes through our forced air furnace that was felt when a wood stove fire was lit, or when one of those giant stone hearths hundreds and hundreds of years ago was lit. That relief from the cold feels the same in our bodies. Across time, humans are connected by the life-giving properties of light and fire, and also by these psychological concepts they evoke. One of the things that is central to Kwanzaa is the idea that we are connected, that we are connected to one another, that we are connected to the past and to our history, and also that we're connected to the future. We are reminded to be grateful for the gifts we receive and also to be generous in leaving gifts for the future. This is a way that we say life matters. Our lives matter. Every life matters. So these, these lights, take a moment to just look. And you'll notice that we've only lit two of the Advent candles, I'm trying to think if this is the second or the third week of Advent, I cannot remember. Um, but the candles from all these different traditions, the flames are the same. The flames are the same. All these different colors, all these different stories, all these different ways of talking about it, the light is the same. So I invite you to notice that connection, the way that we come together in honoring light and life and hope and faith and inspiration and passion and comfort and clarity, regardless of our traditions. We are going to sing one more song. Again, those of you who know it, hum it inside your masks, please. All right? But if you don't know it, and even if you do hum the words, you all can do the hand motions, which we're going to demonstrate.
did a great job. <laughs> We're going to end today's service and extinguish the chalice with these words from Amy Zucker Morgenstern, a blessing of darkness and light. Blessed is the dark in which our dreams stir and are revealed. Blessed is the dark of earth where seeds come to life. Blessed are the depths of the ocean where no light shimmers, the womb of all earthly life. Blessed is the light into which we awake, the light that sparkles on the waters, that calls the tree forth from the seed, and calls the shadow forth from the tree. Blessed are we as we move through darkness and through light. Go in peace. May the light that is inside you go with you as you leave this place, although these lights are now all extinguished. You carry it with you until we are together again. Go in peace.